When we're selling something new, something different, something better, we tend to fall into this trap of describing it in the context of what they're using today. And in some cases, we have to. We have to start with what they know to build on to what they don't know. And today, we're going to be talking about a couple of superpowers. One, how do you differentiate yourself and not get stuck in the commodity trap? Remember, the person who's listening to us wants us in the commodity trap. Why? Because that's where all the power is for them. If, the, if you're unique and different and they need you, who has the power? Them? Mm, maybe, but you have a lot of power. You got what they need and really should have. And if they don't do it, what are the implications of that? The second superpower is how do you future pace your client? Because right now, they're comfortable. They're even keeled in most cases. <clears throat> if you're going after them, uh, they don't know why they need you. At best, they might be curious about how it works. How do you build that into interest and urgency? These are skills that we're going to be talking about today with a senior sales rep and a leader. I think you're really going to enjoy this episode. This is um, a great conversation that you should take lots of notes for. It is one of the classic cases that we face in both courses because when you start the conversation, if you use a keyword to kind of put yourself into a category, you very quickly have to differentiate yourself. Otherwise, they'll say, yep, all set, thanks, we got that, we got five of them, and we got three in a box in the corner. If you get in that trap, good luck. And in the complex sale, if you don't really talk about the implications of no, of not changing, they're not going to change. So go to b2brevenue.com right now and check out those courses. The number one thing that I hear from people who finish it is, I wish I started sooner. You know why? Because you, you can buy the course, but you can't buy time. You can't get that year back. Look at it. Look at it. Look in that rearview mirror. Wouldn't you like to go back to the beginning and start all over? Oh, God, would I? What would you give for 10 more years? Huh? To live your 20s over again. Or to have not made those mistakes. I've had to crush your number. That's well worth it. Let's get into the interview. Enough of this silliness. Hey, Josh. Welcome to the show. There's a way of getting started. Give us a little background on yourself. Um, I am the Vice President of Business Development at CO2 Meter Incorporated. Uh, we design and manufacture gas detection equipment. Um, everything's done here in the States. Um, been doing this uh, seven years now. I'm very fortunate to have found something here in Florida that I love and really jump out of bed to do in the morning. Uh, previous to that, I had held a variety of different uh, positions. You know, the, the thing I think that makes me different and the thing I always lean on is I actually spent 10 years in procurement for Costco. Um, so I've sat on the procurement side of the table and the sales side of the table. So I think it gives me a little bit of extra insight as to what folks on that side of the table are looking for, the questions they're going to ask. Um, I think that really helps me to think about things before I walk in the door. And then as we're moving through or having conversations, it really helps me under know or already anticipate what they're going to be asking about. Yeah. And when you were in procurement, well, what was your focus? It was consumer products? <laughs> so I, um, yeah, Costco has regionalized buying. Uh, at the time, we essentially had a West Coast office and an East Coast office. I worked in the East Coast office. I spent some time in candy, salty snacks, cheese, and my last five and a half years were in beer, wine, and spirits. Great place to be. Yeah. Everybody asked me why I left that job. And I just, I told them, I said, you know, Costco is a young organization and a little bit of a glass ceiling. And I felt like it was a good opportunity for me to take what I learned and, and move to the sales side of the, the equation. I had a salesman when I was at Costco that asked me, he said, Hey, can I use the Costco logo? And I said, what are you going to use it for? And he said, I want to put it at the bottom of the Olympic size swimming pool and building because you guys paid for it. That was sort of a realization for me that maybe I was sitting on the wrong side of the table. So. Yeah. yeah, I think we've all had that realization at one point in our life. <laughs> Absolutely. And what do you like about sales? Um, there are a lot of things I don't like. Most of them are things you hit on in your videos and podcasts. <laughs> 
Um, and I think that really goes for anybody, whether it's paperwork or, um, you know, filling out expense forms or those types of things. The thing that really gets me excited, Brian, is I love, and so many people give you this sort of answer. I love helping find people or helping people find their own solution. And a lot of times that winds up being us that are able to solve that problem for them. Um, I don't, you know, the, uh, for 20 years I've heard, oh, everybody should do solution selling. I don't know that you should be solution selling. I think you need to ask some very important questions of customers uh, or potential customers. You need to get that information back from them. And then you need to map back what you can do or what you make or whatever product or service you offer to what they've told you. But the critical element in that is there's two things in my opinion, it's asking the right questions and stopping your brain for two, three, five minutes, whatever, and listening and taking notes about what they're telling you. I, I hate to maybe if, if some of my competitors listen to this or if, if some of my customers listen to this, they're gonna realize how I do this. But if you ask the two or three best questions or critical questions and you shut your mouth, they're gonna vomit the information back at you. If you've earned that, respect, if you've earned that time to ask those questions, then they're going to feel like they owe you that response. And that's really exciting for me is to, is to, is to get to that point where we've cut through all the, Hey, what's the temperature outside? Hey, thanks for coming to visit. Did you like the game? You know, whatever it was, we've gotten to the heart of the matter. We've earned each other's respect for the time that we're spending together. And now I've earned enough for you to tell me what you need. So what do you start with? Do you start with a situational question, like how are you doing it today? Or what how, what brought us to this point? Or I, I would hope that I already, no. in the upfront, in setting that appointment or time or call, I hope that I've already got, got to that point. If I'm just figuring out what their pain point is when I sit down at the table, I think I'm probably already behind the eight ball. So I find that a lot of what I try to do and what I try to teach our team here is to get out in front of these things. Ask some of these questions in the initial conversation, um, earn their respect. Um, we do things a little differently here. We try to be ex a little, have some expertise in so many of these fields that we work in so that we're earning the potential customer's respect in the initial conversation. We're not waiting to try and earn that with a follow-up call or a follow-up email or some data sheet or some information we send them. So if we can establish that rapport and that respect up front, that makes it a, a lot easier when you actually have to get to the heart of the matter. So I, I would hope that I already know what their pain point is or their problems or the solutions that you're, they're trying to solve up front. Um, that way I've already sort of created some ideas in my mind about how we can, we can solve those issues for them and not do that in a follow-up conversation. So typically when you meet with them, they're already interested. They're beyond like curious. Now they're interested. Do they need to buy you or a competitor or can they do nothing? Well, I think everybody can do nothing. You and I both know that. And that's one of the things you talk about all the time is how do you break through those, those fake roadblocks people put up, but you know, you, you did a, 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 a minute the other day on, um, Never let, never let somebody tell you that it's budget. Yeah. Um, you know, budget's never the problem. It's never. you don't know how to get it or it's not important, important enough to enough. you to go get it or you're too low on the totem pole and you no, need to go ask to somebody it. for it. <laughs> it and, and honestly, Brian, for me, if I've gotten to that point um, and somebody's given me those answers, if I haven't gotten those answers already, if I didn't already know that you're not the decision maker or this is going to be groupthink, like shame on me for not knowing that up front. I should have asked, like, do you make this decision yourself? Um, do you have to go to someone for approval? Do you have budget approval? What is the level of budget approval? You know, we do some, we do a lot of work here with, um, with, with folks that are on government grants or with government institutions. And I'll, I'll hear this all the time. Oh, I can't purchase that. Somebody's going to have to contact you with a purchasing card or something. Okay, that's fine. But who is that person? Can I have their name? Can I have their telephone number? Can I reach out to them directly? I'm going to try and short circuit that conversation as quickly as I possibly can. 
So give us an example of that question or a few of them after you've built rapport, you get into the heart of the matter, where do you go there then? Well, <laughs> you know, I, uh, I always, you know, I always have heard people in my lifetime and, and I probably am guilty of it now too, is there's no point in doing all the work and then, then not asking for the business. Yeah. And I think a lot of times people, salespeople are uncomfortable asking for the business because in their mind, they haven't even sold it yet. They haven't gotten to that point where they see that light bulb go off or that person is on the other side, side of the table, shaking their head violently. Like, yes, I get it. I get it. Let's do this. And a lot of people don't ask for the business because they've never, they've never gotten to that point. They've never earned it. So I think one of the critical things that I like to ask uh, prospects or customers is, you know, once we get to that point, is, is there anything today that we talked about that would make you reticent or, or give you pause to move forward with this? I like that sort of question because I think it gets to, they're either going to say, no, it's good. We're ready to go. Hey, great. Here's the, give me the purchase order now. Let's roll. Or they're going to back to the, to the initial part of our conversation. They're going to show you the respect and say, okay, no, you haven't earned that. And here's why. And then if they, when they tell you, here's why, they've given you those hurdles that you now need to cross in order to earn that business. So the follow-up question then for me, the next follow-up question is once we knock these next two or three things out for you, is that the point at which you can move forward with the business? And I hate to say it this way, but you got to sort of hem people in. And I'm not saying you have to use their words against them, but I'm not doing this because I want to just go round and round on a hamster wheel with folks like that's not fun for me. I want to, I go through all these machinations because I want to get to the point where you and I are going to shake hands and maybe virtually these days, a handshake is good enough, but that we're going to shake hands and we're going to look across the table from each other and say, you know what? I trust this person. They're going to follow through on their commitments. They trust me. I'm going to follow through on my commitments and this is good to go. But how about, because a lot of times, People just want to think about it. People, <laughs> well, they're looking, they're not really having thought about it. Right. It's the paralysis of analysis, right? Or they just don't see the options or it's not urgent. It happens. Um, if they don't see the options, I always mean, that always means to me that I haven't addressed their need or concern directly. Yeah. I might have mentioned it or talked around it, but I haven't gone right at it. Like if your pain point is X, I need to at some point in our conversation say to you, here's how we solve for X. Um, but the, the needing to think more about it, I, again, I think it just means that I haven't laid out the critical case. Now, urgency is a completely different conversation. Yeah. I know every salesperson in the world thinks, has a portion of their brain that thinks, I can create someone's urgency. I, I, I think it, you can speak to someone's need and their urgency, but I don't know that there's a, maybe there's a Jedi mind trick that I can get into to make somebody go all of a sudden like, wow, this is urgent. Wow. The, only, the only person I think in, and this is maybe just specific to, to what we do, but in my experience, the, the urgency is created by the end user. It's, I have a problem now. I have to solve this problem now. Does what he's talking about solve that problem for me? And what we try to do here is not just be available when they have the problem, but give them the information necessary to help move them from insight to action is the phrase a lot of people use. When the time is right, I want them to think Josh was the guy that could solve this for me. And that's a, that's a, a matter of laying out the case for them in the initial conversations. So, you, you know, because I've heard people say you can't create urgency or increase it, but I, I see it done all the time. Yeah, I, I, I shouldn't have said it that way. You can help press that point for them. Yeah. 
you can help um, move them off the back of their chair to the front of their chair where they're leaning in and engaged. Um, I know for us, you know, a lot of people, we do a significant amount of business in the restaurant world. And a lot of folks are now know they're required to have a specific monitor, whether we make it or somebody else makes it. But a lot of these people say, well, I'm not going to do it till the fire inspector tells me to do it. have to, yeah. Till they have to. Well, okay, that's great. I understand that everybody's budget conscious these <laughs> days. Go call the fire inspector. <laughs> well, a lot of people do accuse me of like then going and calling the fire inspector and saying, "Hey, can you go inspect these people?" These guys don't I don't <laughs> actually, I don't actually do that. That would be that would be terrible. Yeah. Um, but what I do mention to them is, I understand. You know, everybody's budget conscious. You want to wait until you absolutely have to do this. But be aware. A couple things. Um, it's the right thing to do. You need to keep your employees and your guests safe. Um, and insurance companies are getting to the point where if you don't have it installed, they're going to start raising your premiums. And that's going to cost you more than actually doing this. And a lot of times folks are like, okay, now I can get off the sideline because he's given me the right information to move me off the sideline and move me on to the place where I've got to make the decision. That's it, because a lot of us sell something like that, which is essentially an insurance product or a prevention product. And I I always used to have fun with it. It's like, do you really want your attorney to realize that you were aware (laughs) of this? Yes. And you thought you were saving money by delaying this. Yeah. And it's, it's strange because, uh, you know, we deal, we have a lot of corporate entities that we have partnerships with and, you know, I remember the first time I walked into Chipotle after we had signed the agreement and the first person I met in the conference room on the day I was in was their risk officer. I believe it was titled the risk officer. Well, if you have a risk officer at your company or someone that deals with risk, then yeah, like, trust me, I'm going to find who that person is. They're going to create the urgency for you. Yeah, because, you know, looking forward and then backwards a year from now something bad happens and, right and i i get called in as so did you present this and what was their reaction here's the date and time and here's the people in the meeting and here's my notes and here's my follow-up email yeah and you think you're saving the company money right the, that type of thing because i why now is one of the big things that everyone's facing because everything sounds good Everything is needed in some way, but there's a bunch of stuff. There's a queue of things that they can spend their time and money on. There are, and, and your job as a salesperson is to move that need as far up in the queue as you can possibly get and to leapfrog as many other nice to have or need to haves. You, you have to get out of the nice to have yeah. bucket. Absolutely. If you're in the nice to have bucket, you probably should not be in sales. Right. If you're in the need to have bucket, that's a great start. But how do you continue to move yourself up there? And it's not a phone call that says, hey, I wanted to check in with you or an <laughs> email that says, hey, I'm going to be in Detroit next week. Can we have lunch? It's, hey, Brian, I know we talked in August about X, Y, and Z. We've made some changes to how that's going to operate that speak directly to the two or three things that you had problems with when we originally spoke. I'd love to be able to share those with you. When do you have three minutes? Yeah. And if I can't synopsize those things in three minutes, I probably shouldn't be doing sales either. That's, I guess that's one of my other big pet peeves is for folks is if I meet you and you're a salesperson and you stumble through your elevator pitch or you can't tell me what it is you do in 15 seconds, again, that's, I, I when I started here, we didn't have a, um, a real concerted effort on sales and marketing. And I think one of the things that I struggled with from the start, because we're a very scientific, very technically oriented, proficient organization. One of the things I struggled with because I'm not a scientist or a a mechanical engineer or those things is I had trouble synthesizing and boiling down our message into those 10 or 15 words. But I'll tell you what, when I got it, you know, maybe six, eight weeks in, Once I knew what that phrase was, we design and manufacture gas detection equipment. Once I had that boiled down, then what I tried to do was 
take that and then layer in for each of these different conversations. So when I deal with a laboratory, it's one add on to that. When I deal with a restaurant, it's a different When I deal with a fire department, it's a, it, you have to be able to take your, your secret sauce and then you have to build up on it for, for each of these people's needs. And yeah. I find a lot of folks just stick to that one 10 or 15 second pitch every time, but it doesn't fit. That's great if you're, if all you're doing is this one market, but trust me, if all you're doing is this one market, you're never, ever, ever going to get out of that niche. You're always going to be the niche salesperson. You're never going to be, you're never going to be able to grow the breadth of the business. And that's one of the things that we've been fortunate with here in the last year. You know, nobody, uh, anybody who claims they saw the pandemic coming besides maybe people in the laboratory world or science. Okay, great. Good for you. Nobody else saw this coming, but we had made a decision probably three or four years ago to start to broaden the breadth of the business. So don't yeah. just focus on restaurants or breweries or the cannabis industry. Let's focus on what can we do for the scientific and medical community? What can we do in welding? What can we do in all these different areas? Well, when the restaurant business goes in the toilet in, in March, we were already had already ramped up marketing and sales activities in all these other areas, which gave us the ability then to penetrate through those and to move past sort of that sluggish nature that people have been in the last nine months. But a lot of that had to do with the fact that we could take our original verbiage and convert it into what people needed to hear. I bet in your space, you've got to have the messaging so that it doesn't land where they're thinking I already have that covered. Correct. It's, and it's also, we don't want to get, we don't want to pitch it right. at someone and have them say, well, these guys are knuckleheads. They don't know what they're talking about. Like I can't walk into, you know, Lawrence Berkeley national laboratory, not that they'd ever let me walk in probably, but um, I can't talk to those guys on the level of information they need without me owning some expertise on our side about how our stuff does what they need to do. If I just come in and be like, Hey, I got devices for you. So does everybody, right? We yeah. got devices. Yeah. We got boxes of them standing over yeah. there. We, yeah. By the way, Los Alamos has a lot more devices and maybe you should go pitch them too. But yeah, that's. And, and how do you get around that type of problem with this? Oh, we're covered. We've got a, a methane thing on the wall. We've got this thing over here. Well, the first thing I do, Brian, honestly, is, hey, I'm glad that you've got that. I'm glad you're safe. I'm glad you guys have secured that for yourselves. Tell me why you picked that one. Yeah. Tell me why you chose that set of devices. And then I will always try to follow up to say, hey, listen, if I think that what we do and what we have to offer is comparable or is better than what you already have, are you willing to have another conversation with me? You've got to give them a reason to want to talk to you again, but it can't just be like we said, I can't just be, can I follow up with you? Right. That it's is the lamest. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And that, and then that goes back to that initial conversation. You know, have you diagnosed and gotten the information out of them that helps you create that map for you and the prospect to get to the treasure? Yeah. I like that treasure map idea. Yeah, you can steal that one. You, yeah, listen, I'm sure you'll have a video on it tomorrow. You'll be walking around the neighborhood like, hey, I thought about things as a treasure map. No, 10 years ago, I wrote about a map. <laughs> <laughs> Day, can I see the email on it? Can you prove it? I got a book. It's a book on Amazon. I'm, <laughs> I'm kidding you. No, but, but that's it. Because too many reps think stimulus response. Uh, st right. Statement, objection, objection handle. It's like, uh, but it's not supposed to be adversarial, Brian. If you, if it's sort of adversarial like that, then you've set your, then your, your prospect is probably sitting back in their chair. They have their hands folded, you know, all those visual cues that. that tell you that they're not engaged. Uh -huh. um, I, I think for me, I think about things a little differently. Um, I was brought up by two parents that were teachers. And I was always taught, you have two ears and one mouth for a reason. You're supposed to listen twice as much as you talk. 
And they also taught me to always be educating myself, which is great because, you know, when somebody walks in my office and be like, hey, we're going to do propane detection. Like, okay, I guess I get a better browse up on propane. Um, but that means that I am better armed. I've got more, I always, an old manager of mine always called it, you got to have more tools in your Batman tool belt than the other guy does. So the more tools I have, the more ways we can have conversations, conversations, not that back and forth Marshalls, that you're talking about. Yeah. Right. It's not pitch me, pitch you. And it's, you know, a lot of the things I hear today are people are listening to, are speaking to argue or listening to argue, not listening to hear what the other person is saying. Understand, yeah. As a salesperson, you have to shut up. You have to let the other person talk. And by the way, oh my God, by the way, when there's silence on the phone, that's okay. That means they're thinking about it. It's okay for there to be five or 10 minutes of awkward silence. Let them talk. It's okay. Because that silence forces them to think mm -hmm. instead of react. Right. And then you've put it on them. It's, it's them coming to those conclusions themselves, not you pointing the conclusion out or drawing it out of them. They've thought about, they've come to that thought or conclusion themselves, and then they've solidified it in their brain. That's their thought. It's their idea to move forward. It's not your idea. And, and I got to believe that it's hard to articulate how these devices are different than other devices. Do you no, I'm, I make them so they're much better. Of course they are. <laughs> A little bit more than that, right? Probably. Like metaphors, stories, analogies. Yeah, and because we deal with so many different markets, Brian, I think it's different in every conversation. So, you know, I will I would say this. Once we had secured, and I think we're going on six years or seven years now, once we had secured the relationship with the folks at Chipotle, it was a lot easier for me to go into the others that are now partners of ours and say, hey, Chipotle does it with us. Like that immediately gave us credibility in that yeah. world. But then I had to go and our team had to go and find ways to build that credibility in all these other markets. So it's certainly nice to have someone say, I've used your device. It works exactly as designed. It does everything I needed to do and more. I would love to be a reference. That's great. Sales reps you don't get that very often. So if you get it, use it. Um, but I think the other piece is you've got to work to sort of find, you, you certainly have to know what their pain point is and, and you have to be able to say, you know, it's not just a different color or it doesn't just measure differently. Why is it different? Why did you make a, why did we make a device for that need? And I think the, one of the biggest things that we have done here is we've changed the conversation a little bit. We always now, before going to manufacturing a brand new device, we always go to the market first. And we go to trusted partners or customers and say, we're thinking about doing X. Do you have any ideas about that? Do you do it? Do you have a customer that does it? Can we talk to them? Hey, why would you do it this way? What measurement range do you need? How fast does it need to operate? Does it need to data log? All these all these questions I can ask of people that are already probably doing this. So then when we go to market, we can say, we designed this in collaboration with the folks from the Brewers Association. We had brewers specifically test this device for us. That then moves me out of, oh, it's just another product or another monitor into, wow, they've really put some thought into this and time and effort. Because I, I was in this a, a similar type of space on the IT side, and everyone was using the same keyword, firewall. But firewall had 50 different meanings. Detection devices, I got to believe, you know, it means something. It's a Rorschach. You, you, you show it, and there's a different impression uh, in everyone's mind. A hundred percent, because some people refer to it as a sensor or a monitor or yeah. a detector or an analyzer. So I or our team has to know what does that mean? Um, yeah, what does that mean in their world? What is that yeah. person in their world going to ask the question of? Yeah. Do you know how hard it is for a salesperson not to answer the phone when it rings? 
<laughs> Stimulus response. Right? Exactly. I'm like Pavlov's dog right now. <laughs> it's an order. Well, that's it. You kind of got to, what worked for me in that space was I came up with an analogy of going to the airport and going through a metal detector. It's like what ours does is look inside the bag and then inside the items in the bag without them opening the bag. Others look for metal. Right. Or, or there's just a wand or a visual yeah. inspection, right? So you got people to understand intrinsically what made your product different from competitions. Exactly. Yeah. Right. It's, because competitors were 5K, we were 50K. So they're not going to buy on price. <laughs> so you gotta, no, you if they did, understand. that's a bad procurement guy. <laughs> and, and the thing is, you know, insurance is easy to sell after the car is in an accident, right? right. There's immediate value. <laughs> Right. It's, it's harder to sell before the car's in the accident. Well, and probably the optimal space is to be able to provide that person the insurance in between the moment of which it's about to happen and the moment that it does happen. Mm -hmm. But uh, like, if you can do that, if you've got that magic bullet, congratulations, because I don't know that anybody else has it. But to be able to paint that vision or help people create their own vision is really the is one of those magic touches that that I think makes not only makes salespeople so rare, but makes good salespeople just a dime, a, a gem. Yeah. And, and how about, do you have reps underneath you or with you? Or? Yeah, so we have, um, we have five total people and we're a small organization, but we've got five total people doing either inside or outside sales. And it's, we're always trying to upskill. We're always trying to train. We want the folks answering the phone to be able to answer more and more of those questions and then really leave sort of the top line stuff for the big picture stuff for the more complicated stuff for, you know, our VP of sales and myself. Cool. And what do you see the distinction between like the top performers and the middle? Is it a scale? You know, I know that, I know the easy answer is the paycheck. Um, but what drives that? Is it a mindset, a skill set? I think it's a combination of things. I, I think, and you've talked about this before. I think for us in this world. And I think for most salespeople, you have to have a level of curiosity. Yeah. You have to want to be able to, Learn. you know, you talk about people doing too much research. Um, and I think that that people can get way in over their heads on research, but being curious about that customer or that product or that next market is critical. Being able to ask intelligent questions about those types of things. Hey, I read through the white paper you gave me on X. Um, I've got a couple questions and to have them be more in-depth questions, really it speaks volumes, but then to be able to take that information and translate it and create your own conversation about it, um, I think is, that's really what sets great salespeople apart is they're able to make the conversation their own. You could teach me about the the firewall product all day long, Brian, but unless I can Connect it. synthesize it, understand it, and then be able to put it in my own words, I can't use, I could walk in and use the metal detector scenario, uh, uh, hypothesis all day long, but it's not going to sound like me. Yeah. And so often I hear, because we get sold to too, so, so often I hear salespeople and they're they've clearly memorized a script, which then says to me that they haven't done the due diligence to sort of learn the space and learn their own product and be able to have that conversation. It's, it almost makes me want to hit the eject button at that point. But it also, at some point, I also want to like listen and take notes and be like, Hey, listen, I'm not going to buy this, but I also want to let you know as a salesperson, here's where I think you fell down. I know that comes off as jerky, but I, I, I kind of want to help that person along. You know, if you really want to be in sales, you need to think about these things. If you're just trying to get a paycheck, then, then go ahead and keep doing this. But then you better play the numbers game because you got to put way more balls in the funnel than you think you do. And that's it. And when you, I love the word conversation and the magic of a conversation is getting the other person to talk you know, try and dig into those questions a little bit deeper and, and think of it as the choo-choo train. You got to get, got to get those wheels moving. But once they're moving, it's, it takes you a just sit back and enjoy it. 
And it, listen, it takes a long time when it trains up to speed, it takes a long time for it to stop. Just let it go. Just just don't fight it. Don't put the brakes on, just let it coast. But you're right. I think those conversations are, I, I think if you're a real salesperson, that's what excites you is the conversation. It's yeah. Everybody wants the sale and the purchase order and the number to go up on the board or ring the bell or whatever it is. But if you're a, a really great salesperson, your satisfaction is not does it derive from the ding of the bell. Your satisfaction is derived from, wow, I, that was awesome. They challenged me. I had to really get out of the, the day to day. I had to really get into what I can really do for them. I, I, that's, that's what I think a real salesperson really loves about the job. I think you're right. Hey, Josh, I appreciate your time today. Where can people go to connect and follow you? Um, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, I try not to do the others, but yeah, we're, we have a pretty substantial, um, presence online, www.co2meter.com. If there's something we can help with, we're education first. We're not a, we're not just selling people. So I do appreciate the time, Brian. This has been great. Thank you very much. The two words that I hear from reps all the time when a deal goes sideways is I wish I, I wish I did this. I wish I knew that. I wish I paid attention to it. I wish I prevented it. The challenge is it's not too late. It's just hard to repair. That's all. And how do you prevent I wish I? You have to prevent it. How do you prevent it? You got to know where you are and where you're taking the client. You have to understand the game you're playing. Too many of us, we take it like uh, we wing it. We get comfortable with confirmation bias that we've been doing this for a certain number of years. It's natural. That's what I hear from every sales manager I talk to. I've been doing this for a number of years. And you know what they say about their worst reps? They get pushback. They don't want to hear about alternatives. They don't want to talk about deals. I know what I'm doing. Well, really? Do you think a surgeon would say, Uh, to another surgeon, hey, I know what I'm doing. No. You know what they do? They sit down and they say, well, what do you think is this? Good doctors insist that you get a second opinion. Why? Because they know that their opinion is not the only opinion. They know that someone else has a different perspective, might have a different specialization, may have seen this before, may have um, seen something that they aren't seeing or see it differently. And they can discuss it and re- make a recommendation that is, is wise and has judgment in it. That word judgment keeps coming up as a key differentiator in great salespeople. But how do you judge judgment? How do you evaluate judgment? Where's the field in the CRM for my judgment skills? It doesn't exist. Well, sales is turned into this robotic activity. The only thing is our customers haven't turned into robotics. They're still people. They're still mammals. They still got problems. They still want to fix issues. They still want to buy stuff. But they need help. And if they're not already in active pain, we've got to get them curious, get them interested, have a process to do this. Sales is so much more of a cerebral game than anyone's willing to admit. Everybody wants it to be a you know or you don't know, a quiz-based activity. That's accounting. That's engineering. That is not sales. Sales is by far the most difficult game because it's unconfined. It's infinite. Like when you play chess, the pieces can only move in certain ways. They're predefined. You can't change that. You can't say, well, I'm going to move my pawn like a queen. You'd like to, but you can't unless it gets all the way to the other end. Then you can convert it to a queen. And you got to understand these rules. And in sales, there are rules. There are laws. And we don't learn them until we break them. And then it's too late. And the complex sale especially is just full of traps. You're playing a game where you're going to lose more than 50% of the time. If you're playing a game where you're going to lose more than 50% of the time, you better prepare. 
And if you don't prepare, you're going to lose more than 50% of the time because the other person is, might be hungrier than you, might prepare more than you, uh, might have more years than you, or might care more than you. What's their superpower? What are they planning on doing? And when you hear these one-on-ones and, and it's like, oh, I wish I... Those two words come up a lot, and I try and emphasize why do this, why do that, before you need it, before it has to happen, because a lot of repair calls. Hey, the deal's in the ditch. Can you help me out? Okay, let's 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 play that game, and I try and help. But if you apply the course, you prepare. And nothing makes me happier than to hear the emails from the people who have taken the course. And I'll, I'll be posting a lot of interviews with the people in January once every the, the, you know things clear out, so that you can understand the results that people are getting. And and these are not, you know, what you would think of as natural salespeople. A lot of them have no sales experience. They're entrepreneurs. They got their own company. So they care, they got that, they're motivated, they got that, there's no base salary, so they're highly motivated. And when you see the success that they have, the light should go on. Because you can say, well, I could do that if I applied my time and energy to it and a couple of pennies. So why do people not do it? Ah, a little arrogance, don't want, oh, I've got 10 years. Well, why are you listening to the podcast, right? It, it, it not, it's not for entertainment. There's much better entertainment sources out there. You're trying to become better. You're trying to find other distinctions. What are other people doing? What are other people facing? That's why you should take the course. Dig into it. Apply a year of your life to becoming great. You spent four years in college getting a degree. Uh, how'd that work out for you? I did it. You know, I went at night took me five years. I worked my butt off. And, you know, it it was a good academic exercise. Did I learn anything useful? Ah, You know, I, I, maybe, you know, I don't want to down it. Um, It gave me confidence that I had it. I never showed it to a single person. I put it on the resume. I put it on the applications. People would ask about it occasionally, ask about GPA. That's when I knew that was the wrong company to go to. But, okay, I did that for five years. Spent a lot of money, a lot of nights, a lot of weekends, a lot of summers. And what if I had did that with sales? Oh, boy, earlier in my career. And when I got into business-to-business sales, I was hungry because, uh, you know, when you lose a deal, when you spend three, six months on a deal and you get nothing, You get your base salary, but your boss looks at you a little weird like you screwed it up. It's always our fault. doesn't matter why you lose it. You lost it. It was on the forecast. Now they bug you about it, and it's got to close. And, you know, you look at the bank account, but then when you win one, when you get it. And I remember getting my first enormous deal, my first six-figure paycheck. I was a kid. You know, I was like, th- this was twice what I made as an engineer. Twice in one paycheck. One bi-monthly paycheck was twice what I made in a year. I was like on fire. I was like, this is the greatest thing ever. You know, I went out and got a car and I, I thought I was on top of the world. And I was like, I want to keep doing this because the losing hurts. But the winning feels so good. You know, and that, that company invited us to this party, their annual party. And me and my boss and my team were there. And they, they called us out as one of the key contributors of the company's success. And that felt great. But boy, did that commission check feel good. You know, and I, I always knew I was money motivated. But I was competitive. I had all the other things. But... To, to get that, I go, that's two years' pay. Two years in one month. And I was hooked. And I, I wanted to study it the way I studied engineering. Nights, weekends, listening to other people, 
comparing approaches, analyzing it. And that's what you get out of the course is that experience. And it's not one job. There's a lot of jobs and a lot of hard jobs. Uh, None of them were easy. The only thing that came close to easy is when IBM bought the company I was at. And even then, you know, it was hard for the, the wrong reasons. But, you know, it was still wasn't easy. I shouldn't say easy, but um, it was easier. You know, you had a brand, you had a lot of help, but most of the jobs were bare bones startups. You know, here's a laptop. There's no marketing. Here's your quota. What have you done for me lately? And I'm sure you've, you're used to that now. Commit a year. Do it for you. Don't do it for me. I don't care about the money. You know, yeah, I, I like to be successful right now, you know, but I'd I got to tell you, when I get those emails, when I hear about deals closing, that means a hell of a lot more mon- to me than that tuition of the course. It honestly does. When people have breakthroughs and they fill up their calendar with meetings and they finally kind of flip and say, you know, I, I fought it at the beginning, but I see it working now. Okay. Well, you don't have to switch overnight. You can dabble with it, get some success, dabble a little bit more. It's a skill. It's a performance. It's not a test. It's a performance. Give it a shot. Go over to b2brevenue.com. Check it out. Put it on your list for Santa. We'll see you next time. Make sure you're checking out the other podcasts. Sales Leadership Show. Got a great one this week. I'm sure you're going to like it. Great sales leader. Talk about this guy. Door to door. Seven foot three inches tall. (laughs) We had a a good little giggle about that. Imagine looking through your peephole and there's a seven foot three guy on the other side of it. It, Talk about um, a challenge. (laughs) You you would think it's like a process server or somebody, a bill collector. You wouldn't think of it as a salesperson, but that's funny. Sales questions, brutally honest answers. If you just like the tips and tricks and quick answers, that's a a great one. Short and sweet and to the point. Listen to the ones you want. Also, B2B Revenue Leadership Show, the best leaders in B2B, get to know them. They're hiring. Hey, anybody need a great job, a great partnership? Connect with them. We'll see you next time. Secret. Give me a tip. What do you do in this case? And it's like, okay, let's get into the game. You're all playing whether you admit it or not. If you sit in the bleachers and you look around, I don't know. You've got to get into the game. And the way to do it is to really see how the game is played before you get hit with the ball in the head. <laughs> Most of us, we don't wake up until, you know, the soccer ball hits us in the head. You see that in the, in the games. The kid is just standing there, boom, boom, right in the, oh, I, I should do something. The natural traps that we fall into all the time in the complex sale are unavoidable. You have to prevent them. Because once you're in them, repairing from them is really difficult. Winning the complex sale is a game changer. And the time to start is now. Go to b2brevenue.com. Check it out. You get office hours, which is an hour meetup every other Friday. Uh, I always prepare a lesson. We talk about case studies. It's all recorded and put in the course. You never miss a thing. You get one-on-ones, 30-minute Zoom call with me, applying it to your particular situation. You get the core content, which helps you define and map out your sale. Find out where the traps are. Find out how to add direction, momentum, and control to your deals and close them. Instead of looking at it like a black box, checking in, dealing with one person, trying to understand why the CFO kicked it back, why legal isn't moving forward, how to get the board to approve it on the first go around, We've gotten seven-figure deals through like magic with this course. And you get to hear the deal progression, get to see how they did it. What's better? And no one's judging you. No one knows who you are. No one knows what you're selling. No one cares. It's all about getting deals done, staying away from tips and tricks, and focusing on strategy. So make sure you check it out, b2brevenue.com. Make sure you listen to the other podcast, Sales Questions, Brutally Honest Answers, the B2B Revenue Leadership Show, 
and the Sales Leadership Show, my newest show. You get enough shows? Okay. If you see my stuff on LinkedIn, please give it a little thumbs up, a little like, a little comment, a little share. I'd appreciate it. And we'll see you next time.